Now, of course, if you spent all your time wandering around the world gasping at everything and saying how wonderful, how amazing, uh, I've woken up after a hundred million, million centuries, what a trip, people would think you were a bit odd and you might even get arrested. We do, of course, have an ordinary life to get on with. We do have a living to earn. We've got to earn our living being a solicitor or a lavatory cleaner or something like that. But nevertheless, it is worthwhile also from time to time shaking off the anaesthetic of familiarity and awakening to the wonder that is really all around us all the time. So how are we going to shake off the anaesthetic? We can't actually go to another planet, but fortunately we don't need to because we can go to regions of our own planet which are so unfamiliar that they almost might be another planet. This is another planet, this is Jupiter. It's a fantasy picture of Jupiter conceived by the astronomer Carl Sagan and he's imagining life forms that might live in the upper atmosphere of Jupiter called floaters. If there were life forms in Jupiter they would be called Jovians. So let's use the word by Jovians for creatures on this earth that are so odd that they might almost be from another planet. Here for instance is a deep sea fish. You would have to go on a long journey in a submarine on a diving suit to see that fish. This is exactly the same species of fish. The only difference is that this has just had a meal and that hasn't. That's looking for a meal as you can tell from its ravening jaws. These creatures look pretty monstrous to us. I suppose by their standards we might be thought monstrous. This one is another deep sea fish. This has a luminous lure uh, made by bacteria, luminous bacteria, and it uses this as a bait to lure prey into its vicinity. It then slams its fishing rod down into the vicinity of its jaws, opens them, and gulps in the prey. A very weird Bijovian creature. We don't even have to go to the deep sea, as a matter of fact, to see pretty weird creatures. I was once attending a lecture by a colleague who worked on octopuses, and he said the fascination with octopuses is these are the Martians. And he meant that, look at this, this creature could easily be from Mars, couldn't it? Watch the color change. That creature, that cuttlefish, it's not an octopus, it's a cuttlefish, is changing color at will. Look at the waves of color falling over it. That's not shadows falling over it from outside. That's internally controlled by the animal, by its own nervous system. It's registering emotion, signaling to other creatures, others of its own species, by Jovian creature. We don't even have to go to the sea at all. These are all insects. They all have the same basic insect body plan, which they inherited from a common insect ancestor which lived about 350 million years ago. They all look like insects because they've inherited the, those attributes. They all have a head, a thorax, an abdomen, but in this case it's enormously elongated to look like a stick. Here, the same body is flattened out in this bug. Again, the head, thorax, abdomen, uh, three pairs of legs, antennae, wings. Here, butterflies, the same basic body plan, pulled and stretched, kneaded into different shapes. But basically, the same shape. They've never quite shaken off their ancestral influence. But we were talking about shaking off our anaesthetic of soporific familiarity. And another way to achieve the illusion of waking up on a distant planet is to shrink ourselves, to go on a different kind of journey, to a much smaller scale than we're used to. This is a dust mite. It's the sort of thing that you've met often in the carpets of your own home, but didn't know it. It's hugely magnified by an instrument like this, which is a scanning electron microscope. And we can use the scanning electron microscope just as though it was a telescope pointing at some distant planet, so strange are the sights that it shows us. I think we have a volunteer to work the electron microscope. Now your name is? Louise. Louise. Do sit down, Louise. Now, on the screen at the moment, we have what looks like a jungle. We can think of it as a jungle on another planet. Now, you know how to work the joystick and navigate around. You also know how to zoom out and in. Um, what about zooming out and seeing what this jungle really is? Okay, let's go slowly now. There's some curious 
rounded objects there. Go further. Two little patches of rounded objects. Go further. Go on. Right, now I think what we're seeing is the head of a mosquito. There are the compound eyes, lots of different facets of the compound eyes on either side. In the middle are the sockets of the antennae. Zoom out further. And again, and there's the whole head. You can see the whole round head with the sockets for the antennae and the rounded compound eyes with all the different facets. Now perhaps we can navigate to a different insect. Yes, the machine has been pre-programmed to move now to a different part of this strange landscape. And I hope we're going to see something else in a minute. What's this here? Looks like another jungle. Um, so let's move around and explore what we think it is. I can't see anything yet. Ah, oh, wait a minute. Let's zoom out a bit and see whether we can see better then. Again, again. Oh, that's looking like something. I think that's a pair of wings off to the left side, isn't it? So I think that might be the thorax of an insect of some sort. Let's try moving that way and see what we see. Other way. Let's speed it up a little bit. That's right. Ah, oh, it's the abdomen of a bee, I would think. Go on. More. Now, what's that? There's something curious poking out. Try and steer your way around so that's in the middle. Other way. And then down a bit. Now zoom into it. Keep, I'll keep steering, shall I? Right, zoom in. Need a bit of focus, I think. Let me do that. It looks to me like the head of something else. Zoom out again. What that is, as a matter of fact, is a tiny parasite. Thank you very much indeed, Louise. It's a tiny insect parasite called a strepsipteran, which is parasitizing a bee, and what you saw was the strepsipteran poking out below the armor plating of the bee there. There's its compound eyes, and there's its body, and that is one armor plate of the bee. So we've been on a journey using the scanning electron microscope to the world of the very small. And that's another way of capturing the strangeness of our own world. Yet another way is to go into our own bodies and look at the detailed structure of our own bodies. For example, this is a picture of a human brain. And each of these black things is one brain cell. And you can see how many there are. There are only a tiny fraction of them stained to be seen here. And the bewildering forest of interconnections between them. The total length of nerve cells in a human brain, if laid end to end, would stretch right round the circumference of the world, not just once, but 25 times. Well, that's not in, ex in itself a very interesting fact. For one thing, if you actually did that, and you sent a message from one end of this vast great nerve to the other. It would take about six years to get to the other end of the nerve. What's truly impressive about the nervous system is not the sheer number of elements, but their connectedness. The complexity of the connections is truly awesome. Here is just four or three nerve cells. And these are the connections between them. There are about 2,000 wires connecting each nerve cell to each other nerve cell. So the total number of connections in the brain must be about 200 million million. To put that into perspective, if we assume that each of those connections is equivalent to one switching unit of a computer, this gives the brain about 10 million times as many switching elements as a typical desktop computer.